yeah, getting this thing started, man. How would you describe what exactly it is that you do with before school and after school? What is this all about? Hey, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, nice. You have a really nice podcast and I've seen you have had some great guests. So um, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, so what I do is um, basically I'm an animator artist. I see my role as somebody who takes more complex topics and I try to uh, make them clear through art. And it's kind of like a process of, of me myself learning through creating this art and then hopefully that resonates with other people. And so far I think it, it has. So yeah I'm, yeah, I'm basically an animator and now I'm branching off into kind of having conversations in a podcast form with all these people that I admire. So after school is is my first baby. And then now I'm kind of branching off into this second baby before school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's awesome stuff. Now, thanks <laughs> for sure, man. <laughs> now, how would you describe what exactly the topics are that you cover, right? Because it's quite profound stuff that you decide to make animations for and also that you decide to talk about in your podcast. So what does this all revolve around, you know? You know, it's if you just look at each topic every week, it'll seem super random. You know, one video is about pesticides. The next one's about consciousness. The next one's about how our eyesight works. You know, it really, it seems to vary. But when you kind of zoom out and look at all the topics, it, to me, I, I feel like it creates this master body. And each video is like a section of the body. So some videos are very important. They might be the eyes. Wow. But some videos might not be front and center. They might be like the spleen, which is just as important. But, you know, maybe it's not as flashy or sexy or doesn't get a million views. But to me, it's kind of like I, I'm just exploring my own personal curiosities. Mm -hmm. And I've it's strange because I found that the more you just genuinely explore your own curiosity, the more it resonates with other people. Yeah. Anytime I've done the opposite where I've tried to like pander to people or chase views or try to like please an audience of people who I don't know personally, it, it's always fallen flat. And, you know, even if you do get a lot of views, you kind of just feel like you sold yourself out a little bit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Sold your soul. <laughs> well, totally. Yeah. You got to stay authentic for sure. Totally. Yeah. Creating a body. I like that though. A body of truth. Yeah. Yeah, I I tend to think in a very geometric way. So I see every video as part of like a geometric pattern that is spiraling upward towards something higher. Yeah. Almost like an upside down vortex. So they're all revolving around this one idea. I guess that idea would be that we have free will and that we are the creators of our own destiny. I think that is probably the the underlying message behind every video mm. you know every video is is a tool to help you be the author of your own story a little bit more mm. that's awesome yeah amen Thanks. to that thank you yeah man um so where does this all come from for you to be on this wavelength of empowerment and wanting to share it to the world you know like how did you even get started with this that's a great question. Um, I guess it all started with, I was drawing before I could even walk or crawl. My, my dad would throw down a, a pen on a piece of paper and I would like squirm over like a slug and I would just start doodling. Mm. And that evolved into me like obsessively drawing. And then I ended up winning this big award when I was about four years old for this big youth art contest. And then that was kind of like, confirmation that hey maybe i'm pretty good at this <laughs> you know you don't it's hard to know if you're really good at something or not when you're that young but then that sends you down a path of okay this is who i am i'm an artist and um i never really fit in with other artists though you know art the art world is very um it's all about like my truth and expressing um it's almost trying to be like as weird as you possibly can be <laughs> at least modern art is and I always appreciated like the classical art, the cathedrals, the ancient ruins and the the really beautiful Renaissance art. 
So that's the style that I, I was drawn to. And throughout my entire, um, you know, like time in college, I was told, you know, you're not, you're not doing it right. It's kind of funny. Like <laughs> of a lot of my art teachers and I, we butted heads because they didn't, they didn't like my classical art style or I would paint things like palm trees and beaches. And, the, you know, it was funny because towards the end of my college, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to just make the teacher happy. And I'm just going to like go completely the opposite of what I normally do. And I literally just like scribbled something on a, on a page of like printer paper. Like I spent, I spent less than five minutes on this thing. And the teacher was like, this is a breakthrough. This is amazing. You, you really <laughs> found yourself. Anyways, after college, I um, started working freelance, doing animation for different companies. But long story short, that was kind of soul crushing. You know, you're just trying to make a company happy or one person in that company happy. So I felt this angst within to kind of become a storyteller and create videos for the joy of creating, you know, really get back to like what the source of create creation is about. And it's not doing it for some company's bottom line or for profit, really. It's just to create something beautiful. And at the time, I, I um, kind of got screwed over in business and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go completely the opposite and I'm just going to create YouTube videos for a year and see what happens. And I, I gave myself one year. The goal was to hit 100,000 subscribers. And about six months into that year, this was in 2016, I hadn't even hit 1,000 subscribers yet. So I wasn't even 1% of the way to my goal. But then literally on the year, I hit 100,000 subscribers. Because mm. the way YouTube is, it just like, you don't really have gradual steady growth. You kind of like all of a sudden one video goes viral and then another video that causes like five other videos to go yeah. viral. And then suddenly like that's the power of the internet. That's one of the great things about YouTube is like with other businesses, if you get, if you're a t-shirt company and you get exponentially more orders, you're freaking out because you can't even fulfill those orders. But with YouTube, when your channel goes nuclear exponential, you kind of just sit back and you're like, this is awesome. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. this is the, are the servers breaking? Uh, I remember when my first few videos went viral, I was like, I thought, I thought there was a glitch and <laughs> I had a friend at, at Google and I called him and I said, what, what, what's going on here? And he's like, you're on the trending page. Oh. And that was a video called, uh, why country flags don't use the color purple. Mm. And my channel has changed a lot since those early days. And in, in the beginning, I was all about like cute little science videos. Like I, my goal was to try to answer questions that you didn't ask. But the second you saw the question, you had to know the answer. So like, yeah. why don't country flags use the color purple? Um, why does February only have 28 days? Little questions uh -huh. like that where you didn't ask the question. But once you see that, you're like, wait, why is that? Mm. And that format was kind of good for how YouTube was formatted. Um, about eight years ago. Yeah, I feel like I'm pretty new to YouTube still, but like apparently I'm like now an OG. <laughs> yeah. You know, like people are like, I've been watching your channel since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was a big shift that happened with YouTube where they you probably heard about adpocalypse. No. Where they you really had to get clear on whether you're making kids content or adult content. And in order to make kids content, you had to go through a bunch of loopholes and I really didn't want to like have to pigeonhole myself into just kids or adult. And, um, you know, I, I made the, the content for everybody, but with the new YouTube policies, you kind of had to go down the route of making more 18 and over content, not like explicit or anything, but it, so I kind of started to steer away from just making these like cute science videos and more towards like, psychedelics and psychology and philosophy and more deeper subjects and i'm glad i i went that route um and it's just been you know i've had to reinvent myself a number of times on youtube that's a good and bad thing about youtube and content creation is like a lot of content creators they blow up for one particular video and then they double down on that thing over and over again yeah and it's unfortunately you can't just keep going back to that well mm. You have to, you know, it's kind of sad. You see a content creator blow up for something and then they try to like just double down on that same thing by getting more and more extreme about that one thing. And it's funny because they call 
the content creators influencers but then you wonder who's really doing the influencing because uh, like uh, yeah. the audience is demanding this more extreme character of the person or this more extreme caricature yeah and so they have to play into that and i've seen certain creators it's, it's almost crazy you can see a there was a vegan creator who went to a fast food restaurant and that fast food video ended up getting millions of views and you turn around a year later and he's like this morbidly obese fast food guy <laughs> and it's funny when you look at the beginning of his channel he was this thin vegan and then it you know it only took a, a year or two before he was like 400 pounds that's a real story that's a real story yeah <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> i forgot the guy's name um i did a video about audience capture and he was the featured featured creator i usually wow. don't like ever try to talk smack about anybody in particular and this was not trying to talk smack about him but um it was just trying to highlight the phenomenon of of how you can get captured by your audience mm. and you know it's pretty easy for that to happen yeah man that is the epitome of selling your soul to the devil right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah man i guess so yeah i mean it's tough i understand why that happens because people literally make their living off of doing these videos so they're like i still got to put food on the table so i better keep getting the views but like you said, it's actually uh, counteractive in that way. It'll actually destroy you. I mean, was he still getting views? That's the thing. Was that guy, particular guy, still getting views from the fast food destruction? <laughs> um, yes. I mean, that's the that's the the dark side is that he got millions of subscribers, millions of views, and I don't know. It's like think about your own podcast. Like, let's say you had um, several authors on your channel that were very smart scientific or, or whatever and you guys had very academic conversations maybe you got a couple hundred views on per episode and then all of a sudden you have david icon and that particular episode gets a million views so here you've done all these like very scientific rigorous videos and then you, you talk to a, a more out there truth seeker some might call him a conspiracy theorist and that gets all the attention yeah so th so then next you're like well you're just looking at the data objectively of, of the views and you're like, all right, I guess I should talk to more conspiracy theorist type. I yeah. should talk to Alex Jones next. <laughs> and then you get sent down that, that way. And that's kind of just, you know, it's a, the attention economy and yeah. we, you know, people follow the incentives. It's dangerous. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I did have David Icon though. I noticed that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know now. Yeah. That was a while back. Um, that was a wild conversation. Was that a good, good interview? uh it was okay i've had better to be honest with you <laughs> i think it was he definitely gave a lot of good information but in terms of like actually enjoying the process like we talked about before i've had much more enjoyable talks with just regular people with like you know a few hundred subscribers that nobody really knows and that's what mm -hmm. it's all about enjoying the process like you said whether it's painting doing a podcast driving a race car i think it's just about enjoying the process of creation and however that comes about in our life truly and if not, then what's it for, man? Selling your soul, is it really worth it? I think it's only going to lead to more suffering. doesn't matter how much money you're getting, how much attention you're getting. They're probably suffering deep down. You know? Totally. And yeah, enjoy the process. But that doesn't mean you're always going to be happy during the process. I mean, you're going to have some, you're going to experience some dark nights and some big hurdles and many obstacles. But as long as you're creating for your own authentic purpose, it, it won't feel like suffering, you know, it'll, exactly. it'll be a meaningful difficulty striving for something bigger. Mm. You know, if, you, if you're killing yourself for some corporate, you know, you're slaving away from some corporate thing, then the suffering is going to be meaningless. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think a good an analogy would be if I heard a noise in the other room and it was banging and it was really loud and I walk over there and somebody's doing laundry and it's really loud, they're like washing their shoes or something. And I'm just like, oh, I can't take this sound. But if I'm the one doing my own laundry, then I'm like, oh, that sound, I know what that sound is. It has meaning. Mm. It doesn't bother me as much. You know, it's like, if you understand, if it's for a higher purpose, then you can you can bear the suffering. If you know your why, you can bear any how. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. If it's for a higher purpose, you can bear the suffering. That's good. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that is the whole spiritual path, if you want to call it that. What it alludes to, what it eventually gets to, this essence of creation allows one to create their life amidst the suffering. Because we're going to suffer. We're going to go through shit, I think you spoke on. You know, it's going to happen. There's going to be some dark days. But if there's a higher pursuit, there's a higher purpose in one's life, it doesn't negate the suffering. It just makes it a little bit lighter. It feels a little different, right? There's something a little less serious, you could say, about it. Yeah, it's um, yeah, powerful stuff. You know, um, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian writer? Um, yeah. Did he write the Brothers Kamarov or whatever? It's yes. Called? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He he has a book called um, Notes from Underground. That's a really interesting character, but he writes about what happens when people get everything they they want. What happens when your every pleasure that you could imagine is fulfilled, and your only role in life is just to sit in a warm pool and eat cake and have sex and what happens when all those pleasures are just readily available to you? Are you then, then are you happy? And you find out that not only are people not happy, but it doesn't take very long for them to actually destroy their utopia. They'll start wow. smashing things yeah. and start burning things and, and they'll do things that really counteract their well being. And I think you, you see that in everyday life. So life is going to be hard, whether you're sitting in a warm pool, eating cake, or whether you're actually out in the world doing hard things. You know, it's gonna, that's like kind of like one of the core teachings of all these spiritual practices, like Buddhism, principle number one is life is suffering. Christianity, you know, Jesus bears the cross. Like, yeah. you gotta, you gotta bear this suffering, but you gotta do it voluntarily mm -hmm. because life's gonna be hard no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Well said, man. Yeah. Sacrifice. You got to choose your sacrifice. Choose your sacrifice. Exactly. Yeah, man. It's powerful stuff. Yeah, I feel that. So is your sacrifice the time that you put into your artwork? Time and energy? Um, That's a good question. Yeah, I, I'd say that's part of it. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice, though. You know, it's even yeah. when I'm out socializing or watching TV or doing anything, I'm kind of like, oh, I think I'd rather be uh, working on that video right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's an interesting aspect. Technically, I guess you could say you're sacrificing time and energy, but you wouldn't want to be doing anything else. So you're not sacrificing anything, essentially. Yeah. Uh, I guess everything is a sacrifice if you really look at it that way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess you yeah, just got to choose the right one. <laughs> choose the right sacrifice, like you said. I did a video a long time ago about the archetype of the man-child. Mm -hmm. It's an idea from Carl Jung. And it's about um, the boy that never really grows up. And the good analogy of that is Peter Pan. Peter Pan's a great story that... Um, kind of secretly puts that metaphor in there. Peter Pan is seen as like a, a good character, but he's really a representation of this boy that never refuses to grow up. And he tries to convince other boys to not grow up. And they, you know, come into this uh, Neverland. Come on, lost boys, like come get lost with me in this fantasy with Tinkerbell and these mermaids. And Wendy in the story represents the the real world. She represents like growing up and it's like a tug. It's like a tug of war between Peter Pan and Wendy with the Lost Boys in the middle. And so the movie is really an incomplete story because we don't see what happens to Peter Pan later in life. Because if you don't choose your sacrifice early in life, you're going to pay a big price later when you are 40 years old and you're not grown up. If you don't get out of that child stage, but you're a full grown adult. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse for you. Hmm. And so if you're messing around at 25, it's fine. You know, you're still young. But if you're still doing the same things at 35, people are like, mm, might want to get your act together. It's not so cool that you're still living in your parents' basement. If you're doing that stuff at 45, you're kind of just pathetic. <laughs> and so, you know, you're going to, you have to choose your sacrifice. Yeah. You can choose your sacrifice 
voluntarily or it can catch up to you later. And more, if you suppress things, they tend to come up in ugly ways later. Mm, that's real advice. Yeah. For sure. It's almost like we don't have a choice. You got to choose something, man. You got to you know? choose something. You got to choose something. Yeah. You know, another big thing that I, I espouse on my channel is that we have free will. And a lot of the really intelligent people that I've encountered, they don't believe we have free will. They um, make strong cases against it. And, you know, there's very logical arguments against free will. And, you know, people like Sam Harris make them and they're very smart. I respect them. But the thing is, our universe is not a logical place. Huh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And one of the things that doesn't fit into their logical box is consciousness. And so people that are in the camp of no free will often try to explain away consciousness like it's just some byproduct of cause and effect or it's some it's some mechanism it's like a, we're like machines that yeah. once we turn off consciousness ends or i'm i'm in the camp where i i believe consciousness is like a frequency that we are antennas and we tap into yeah so even when the antenna breaks that frequency still goes on mm -hmm. mm. so <laughs> yeah i feel that hopefully these ram ramblings make sense <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely makes sense man for yeah. sure <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that people that are in the camp of no free will, the consciousness, denying consciousness, essentially. It's sort of strange. People that are very materialistic like that, I don't really get it. I think it's just too much mind. They're really intelligent. And I think somebody who's really intelligent can get cut off from that consciousness, the greater consciousness. And just like the miracle right here, right here, right now, the isness, the consciousness that flows through me, you, and everything else. If you're just all mind and analytical, it's like really hard to get through it. It's like it's, it forms like a barricade between your heart center where I think that actually like resonates with us and then the actual consciousness of the all. If the mind is in the way, you can't see it. You can't feel it, you know? Yeah, I think anything that takes, like you were talking about what the definition of evil is. We, you, you mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. Selling yourself out is, is evil. I think anything that takes away your free will is evil. Yeah. And when I go to places that are very much in the camp of no free will, I see what it does to people because it, it robs them of any soul, mm. any sense that they are the author of their own story. And because you're just a victim of your environment, everything, every circumstance is your life. It is a product of an environment you didn't choose genetics you didn't choose, parents you didn't choose. If you don't have free will and you're just a product of cause and effect, you're just a leaf blowing in the wind. Yeah. You have control over nothing. Yeah. And I see a lot of politicians and institutions treating people as if they don't have free will. And the end product is you get this completely infantile, victimized population who can't do anything for themselves, who are not the authors of their own story, and it leads to dependence and tyranny and bondage. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a cycle of civilization. And I think right now we're having a lot of our turmoil and our division is based on this cycle. There are many people who see that we are kind of going towards this nightmare or this bondage state. And we have the power to use our free will and go into abundance and we can create the garden of eden yeah. and there's other people that want to outsource all their free will all their decision making and they want this central power to provide everything for them and mm -hmm. that sounds nice to somebody who's in a desperate situation but the second you outsource your power you become dependent and at best you're going to get the crumbs that fall off the table yep at best you're not going to be getting the filet mignon. You're not going to get the best organic food. You'll be lucky if you get like expired crap, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because you have no power. You have, you have no, you are completely dependent upon this central authority. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that central authority is nice. But as history shows that 
they're not nice for long. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 That's the machine, man. That's Babylon. It's the same story that's been going on for millennia, but now it seems to be getting intensified with um, selling your soul, if you want to call it that, or evil, right? Now it's getting intertwined with the technology that we have, and it's so much easier to be susceptible by that energy of the dark forces, right? Um, but it's also easy, on the other side of the coin, to work with the light and work with your free will. It's a double-edged sword. It's just as easy to exercise one's free will, to live in abundance, as it is to sell your soul. It might not seem like it to the mind. That's the thing. Is if you don't know any better, it may just seem easier to sit back and let the system take care of you, per se. But really, if you go within yourself, you'll see that there's no other way to live than to um, find your own empowerment and live on that wavelength. It's... um. It's actually, that actually is the easier route. If you know what your dharma is, that actually is the smoother route if you go with the flow of that. But it's just hard to see. If you're so stuck in the matrix, <laughs> it's hard to see through it. But once you do see through it, you don't go back. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too. Evil, right? Opposite is live. Mm -hmm. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe. Sorry, I know you're going to say something. I just did a video that had that that exact thing in it. That little really? evil backwards is live. I didn't see it. We probably saw the same thing. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so many coincidences with our, our words. Oh, and yeah. I love to look at like the origins of words and find out like the commonalities and yep. just how like the meanings got twisted. And a lot of times words mean the complete opposite today is what they used to mean. Like, yep. for instance, awful. Like awful used to be like full of awe. Right amazing yeah and now it's like this bad thing it's funny how things get distorted I, mm. I love to you know english is it's got so many hidden secrets and like there's so many silent letters and things that don't make sense today we're like why does c if i say if i say pacific ocean there's three c's in that that those words yeah but they all make different sounds mm -hmm. pacific ocean it's like it makes a C, it makes a K, it makes a sh. <laughs> What's going on there? Yeah. Is there some, so yeah, I, li I like to, there's a, some guys, um, some teachers that, that really get into like the secret meanings behind things like Randall Carlson. Mm. He'll explain like the hidden origins. And so like Atlantis ocean is now Atlantic ocean because yeah. C and S were interchangeable. So it's like, where's Atlantis? Well, maybe it's in the Atlantis ocean, Yeah. but we just changed the name. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely in the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's the importance of choosing the right words and the power behind the word that we're not even aware of. I think getting back to this essence of creativity and power that we spoke on, we hold so much power and weight in our words. So I think you have to make sure to say the right things, especially to yourself, especially when that internal monologue that we all have. Well, actually, people, some people say that some people don't have internal monologue. You ever heard of that? <laughs> no, I, I wish I had a, a quieter internal monologue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's like every time I say something, I'm, I'm already thinking about the comments that it's going to receive. I'm oh, already like, yeah. The second we said the Atlantic, Atlantis is in the Atlantic Ocean, I'm already imagining, oh, God, here comes the whole, here comes the all the people that think it's not there. <laughs> you know, I wish I could quiet that voice down. Yeah, right. Whatever. Let him talk. It's got to be under there, man. There's so much. <laughs> you know how much is unexplored under the ocean? It has to be. It only makes sense. But that's, I feel like a rabbit hole for another time. <laughs> totally. The power of the word, though. There's so much power in how we speak and what it translates into, you know? I think that is like our highest form of power. I mean, we have power in our hands, that's for sure, and being able to create and mold the world and literally make paintings like you do. But really, when it comes down to it, we hold so much power in how we choose to use our word and all the different circumstances that pop up in our life, you know? So I think that is, um, yeah, it's just an important part of the journey of finding this empowerment is knowing how to utilize your voice, your throat chakra. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 
The throat chakra is something that I've neglected for a long time. And I'm, you know, I, for a long time, I was completely anonymous behind the whiteboard. And I was like, very hesitant to put myself out there at all. And now, you know, we don't have the time to be hesitant. You yeah. know, things are moving fast. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's time to just get out there and say what needs to be said, create what needs to be created. And, you know, that we can all feel that time is, things are accelerating exactly. and we're very rapidly heading towards this event horizon where we don't know what's on the other side of that horizon. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's time to just have the conversations. And there's an ancient Chinese pro proverb, may you live in interesting times. Yeah. And I don't know if it's actually really from ancient China, but it's been passed <laughs> around a lot. You know, a lot of these quotes are misattributed, but they're all from ancient China. <laughs> yeah, they all they all go back to ancient China somehow. <laughs> uh -huh. But, you know, I think it's that's a good quote. I say it all the time because we're living in some funny times and there's just you got to just step back and, and be like things are getting so weird that you have to like now talk to other people about how weird things are. Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> is that what you decided to do with starting your podcast, like going from painting into this pretty much a totally different creative pursuit, you know, um, let me ask you in a different way, maybe like what has doing the podcast and just straight out talking to people in long form, conversation done for you and your whole being that's a great question um the podcast was kind of like an opportunity that was sitting there open to me for a while because i've made so many good connections with people i really admire oh yeah you know i'm i'm working with people on animations and we're literally having these conversations not recorded though so i'm thinking how hard is it to just record some of these great talks you know i, I have an hour talk with graham hancock then i talk to Rupert Sheldrake. And then I talked to Andrew Huberman and I'm like, man, I mean, these are all like people that go on the biggest podcast in the world. I think I could probably start something and ask him a few questions. How hard is that? And, um, the podcast is interesting because like, it's a funny game to navigate because people are looking at it as a very like transactional now, like every conversation is some sort of exchange. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do really appreciate how authentic podcasts are. And I've, that's one of the best ways to learn. Like, oh, yeah. Like, literally all day when I'm making art, I've got some sort of podcast playing. And, you know, people in the academic world, I'm also very involved in academia. They belittle podcasts. They're like, oh, what'd you learn that on a podcast? I'm like, actually, yeah, I did. It mm -hmm. was a podcast with a really brilliant person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in a way, podcasts, I'm, I'm really encouraged because, like, on the one hand, our attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, you know, like TikTok, it's like a few second video. But on the other hand, people are listening to eight hour podcasts, like they're getting millions of views. Lex Friedman just puts out an eight hour podcast and it has millions of views. So that's kind of encouraging that, you know, podcasts are something like it's like a glitch in the matrix that, you know, all these people are getting this like free information unfiltered through these conversations. And now like when you turn around and watch the mainstream media, the news, and they're trying to get their point out in these like 60 second sound bites, you're kind of like, well, where's the context here? Where's the nuance? You know, you have to like, mm. just say rhetoric. You have to recite a slogan basically because yeah. you have so little time. But when you get that same person on a podcast, you get to really see the, the real person because mm -hmm. you can't hide who you are for like a three hour podcast. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah man it's the power of the word yeah how's the podcast experience been for you oh man it's hard to say because i'm still in the midst of it literally right now as we speak but overall a great learning process all right if i was to sum it up with one phrase so much knowledge has been bestowed upon me and whoever watches and it's priceless i definitely wouldn't have been able to learn that stuff in the school the people that i've speak spoke to and what they told me and what i've got from it just also just being in the midst of somebody who is like realized and just feeling their soul is something special right like there's something like 
there's just something about just spending time with somebody that is I was gonna say enlightened or has some essence of enlightenment to them there's something about just like being with them that I think is priceless man um yeah man I'm also a big fan of podcasts though too just listening to conversation and it just comes down to you can learn so much you can learn so much from a three-hour podcast or an hour podcast if you just sit down and actually take in somebody's word you'll learn way more than you ever learn in 12 years of school that's for sure and it is a glitch in the matrix i do for i do see it as a glitch in the matrix it's almost like this is the way we fight back against the matrix is through utilizing our free will and in that utilizing our free speech for as long as we have it and actually talking about um stuff that matters too and uh yeah it's just been extremely powerful i see it as my sadhana which is my spiritual practice in sanskrit 100 percent, it is made my um levels of understanding of myself go from pretty much nothing into a little more than nothing i still don't understand myself <laughs> i still don't know but a little bit i've learned so much more than i could ever learn without podcasts pretty much hmm. yeah. well alan watts says that you can never understand yourself because you're always changing exactly and that's why you never know what you really want in life you know when you ask somebody what do you want in life usually they, they don't know or they'll say something like a nice car or mm -hmm. a house mm -hmm. and once they get that house or car they're happy for like two seconds and then they want the next thing you yeah. know it's like that utopia we talked about in the beginning where people destroy their little utopia after so long because they we always want the next thing and that's kind of how our neuroscience works you know dopamine is not about the reward it's about getting closer to the reward mm. we want to feel like we're making progress and so i can talk about this in my own experience like after school is massive it's got over three million subscribers and i absolutely love doing it but i've been so thrilled by the things that are happening on the podcast because that's so new and i can mm. see the progress happening and i'm like wow this is you know, I, I find it oddly that I'm getting more dopamine and more of a sense of delight from things that are happening on the podcast rather than after school, even though after school is getting hundreds of thousands, millions of views per video. And I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's been the thing. That's been the thing for like the last seven years. But the podcast, if I get like a thousand views on a conversation, I'm like, wow, a thousand people <laughs> wanted to listen to me just talk about whatever. Yeah. You know, that. That kind of blows my mind. I feel and you then that. Another thing that, that you reminded me of that I wanted to mention is like the value you're getting from these conversations, the podcast, and me as well from my podcast. It's like I would do this for free because I, I love doing it and I get so much value and reward from it. And I think that's something that you can extract from this conversation if you're listening, that if you're trying to figure out what to do with your life, a good philosophy is just do what you would love doing and then figure out how to get paid for it. Yeah. You know, do what, pursue what you're good at, what you love doing, what the world needs, and then figure out how can I get paid for it? Because a lot of people have that in reverse. They say, okay, what pays a lot of money? Yeah. How much does that job pay? Okay. Then I should do that job. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's completely upside down. Yeah. It's a good point. It's not easy, but I feel as though it's worth it if you go with that. Especially in in these times, it's so hard to navigate like what career path to even take because yeah. things are changing so fast. It's like you get a college degree, two years later, that degree is completely irrelevant, mm -hmm. you know? So that's why it's time to spend your, your time investing in concrete, real things. Like learn how to play an instrument because that's something real and you'll be able to do that forever um build a sculpture build um wooden carpentry tables or something you know build i think we're, hopefully what we're going to get out of this like ai craze is that people are going to really be able to work on things that nourish their soul yeah rather than like the soul crushing bs jobs yeah i agree well i guess they're not bs but they're you know <laughs> Somebody's got to do them. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it's most jobs don't lead to 
soul fulfillment, you know, that essence of creativity that I believe we all have. I think we're all creators in one way or the other. That's the beauty of the human spirit is we're all endowed with this sense of creation. And that's so wonderful. Imagine if every single human being was on that wavelength, all 8 billion of us were creating what we're supposed to create, what we were born to create. I do believe we were all born to create something. We all have our own knacks and and what we're good at, you know, we're our God-given talents from birth. So imagine if we could all exercise that. We'd live in a completely foreign world. It would look alien, right? We would live in something maybe akin to utopia, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, Bruce, Bruce Lipton has a really great idea on this. And he says, imagine that we were born into heaven. And this is heaven right now. Mm -hmm. And when you ask a person, what is heaven to you? Everybody's got a different answer. And it usually involves I'm on a beach or I'm in nature with my family and we're having a great time. We're laughing and yeah. I'm with my loved ones and we've got great food. And I'm like, well, guess what? You can do that right now in this world. Yeah. You know, that heaven is not this like fluffy cloud. Mm -hmm. It's like vague, fluffy, white area. Heaven is different for every person, which means that heaven is a creative place. Mm. And so imagine that we came to this earth to create. That's what our work is on earth. And so when we're creating it right, heaven on earth is here. And when we're creating it wrong, we're in chaos. And so in a lot of ways, we're creating it wrong. But I think there is a mass awakening happening and people are figuring out how to use their free will and be the authors of their own story and create a right. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. And I think we've been creating it wrong for such a long time. Essentially, it's a long story of creating it wrong. Millennia, you know, and I think that is leading us at this point to creating it right. That's what the sages say is the suffering brings us to God. So I think somehow some way there's something in the zeitgeist where people are getting the glimpse into like wait a second there's got to be another way and i think we're finding that other way slowly but surely we're all waking up to like hey man is this worth it is what i'm doing worth it and then finding something that is worth it that has meaning that has some sense of purpose to being here because if not then this just feels pointless right it feels purposeless it feels nihilistic and i understand that i understand where it comes from i used to be there right you've had this you've had a knack of creation since childhood right so that's something special and you followed that but a lot of people don't even know what the hell to do man <laughs> they're, like, they're here they're just like they're just in their you know soul crushing position job that isn't fulfilling so it's tough I understand, but I think if you go on the, if you go within, essentially it will lead you to what will um, give one more fulfillment. If you can see past the confusion and the shit that we got to do to put food on the table, I think that will allow one to find the purpose. Because I do, I do feel as though we all have purpose here. Just a lot of us have it um, veiled it's veiled some thicker than others sometimes the veil is very thin but either way the veil is there the facade is there and it comes from generations past to be honest with you but i think point of my story here if we're going too much into it is if you can just see it that we all do have a purpose have like a sort of blind faith maybe or just faith in general in that in that inherent purpose despite the circumstances in one's life That'll lead the way. You know, it's almost like the universe. If you decide to surrender to it, surrender to God, God will start to conspire with you. But first you have to sort of let your hands off the steering wheel, right? You have to say like, okay, you got me, <laughs> right? I think that's really where it all comes from. And then from there, I think it becomes effortless. That's what I feel at least. Like once you start to surrender every day too, I surrender more and more every day. But the more you surrender, the more God will give you, the more the universe will give you into being an instrument, right? Being like the paintbrush of God. Do you feel like that? Let me ask you that one, actually. Do you feel like when you're creating that this is this creation is just like coming through you? It's not really yours per se. Like you're just, you're literally like the paintbrush 
for this greater force? That is a great question. I've never been asked that question before. I've never heard anybody ask that question before, but (laughs) that is a great question. And, you know, you see it when when a musician is on stage and they close their eyes and they're just like, the music is just like coming from a higher place and it's just flowing through them. They're like a vessel Mm -hmm. and it's almost like this godly thing. And I think that's why, you know, going to a concert sometimes can be such a religious experience or like a spiritual experience because like that divine energy is flowing through them and then it's getting emitted out into the crowd. And artists can do that as well. You know, an artist can paint something as simple as like a doorknob, but they can make it incredibly beautiful in a way that you've never seen a doorknob like that before. Mm. And they can almost capture this like eternal formless nature and they can bring it in and make a doorknob like orange and green and glow. And you're like, God, I've never seen it like that. And, you know, that's one thing that psychedelics do is they kind of remove all those filters that we have. So then we can see things in that new way they, we can see that maybe that God energy flowing through everything, everything becomes alive. And yeah, I, to, to answer your question, when I've worked on videos where I felt like the message was really important and I put everything I had into it, it seemed like time just like faded away yeah. and I forgot what time it was. I wasn't hungry all day. I've gone many days without, God, I didn't eat all day. And I've noticed that those are the times when I'm really like loving what I'm doing. And the more effort I put into the art, the more of a joy it is to just edit the whole thing. Like I I don't have an editor. I don't have like, it's just me basically. But I like doing everything from A to Z, from like curating the content to posting the video to answering the comments. I like to do all of it because it's just like, On the opposite end, if I'm just going through the motions, if I'm just like, oh, I've got a time slot I've got to fill, I'm, you know, I I need to get a video out by next Tuesday. Um, hmm, Let me just like find some clip and throw some animation. Let me, let me do these drawings. Let me just get this done. It's kind of like a slog. It's like, oh, you know? And uh, so really when you're, you're doing your very, very best and you're reaching for your maximum potential, that is when time and the material world just kind of fades away and you tap into this like flow state. Yeah. You're in the zone. In the zone. <laughs> the zone is real. Yeah. Do you feel like you got you get swept away? Right? Like you said, you you lose track of time. You almost lose yourself. Yeah. And the ego. Yeah, pay attention to when you get inspired by something. So mm. it doesn't have to be like it can be in a garden. Like sometimes I I get super into gardening and I'm just like, that's what I want to do all day. Mm -hmm. And then you just forget it. Anytime you, you completely forget about time and you're not thinking about these obsessive thoughts. That's the greatest. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) It seems counterintuitive. It's like, why would I want to lose my sense of self to this thing or this, this act? And, uh, I get that, but that's the mind again, trying to rationalize it. That's the mind truly like being in the state of bliss is just like you're so involved with whatever's going on you could be surfing you could be playing a guitar you could be painting a picture you could be doing a podcast you're just in it right you're just like you are it you become one with the thing and it's just this beautiful dance you could say that you lose yourself to for sure think about what happens when we dance we lose ourselves to the music we become one with the flow that's the thing too is the flow we find that there is some kind of flow um that you enact yourself with and it's quite beautiful you just you just lose yourself it's beautiful man yeah Yeah, you you become completely present and Eckhart Tolle talks about this why people like extreme sports because you're getting that During that rush, you're not thinking about anything else but the exact present moment. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're a snowboarder and you're doing a backflip down some big hill, in that moment, you're not thinking about the laundry or what the bill you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Like, you're completely present and that feeling is very attractive. So it can be addicting. Yeah. But it's beautiful. It's freeing freeing from our constraints of the mind 
you lose the mind. There is no past. There is no future. Truly. Yeah. I've been doing a jujitsu for a little while. Oh yeah. And you know, when one of the coolest things about it is like when you're getting crushed by some big guy, there's nothing you can think about, but that present (laughs) moment. And it's like, you kind of find out who you are when you're in those situations. Yeah. And, uh, most of the day we spend, uh, trying to avoid being confronted by who we are. We try to forget ourselves with social media, with binge watching things, with food, with um, our phone, with, you know, alcohol addiction. All Most addiction is just an, an attempt to forget yourself, you know, or mm-hmm. it's an attempt to get a feeling that we missed in our childhood. Yeah. 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 It's like a uh, distraction from our trauma most likely from childhood like you said i think a lot of our problems a lot of our addictions and habits that aren't exactly good for us do come from just us not wanting to confront stuff that happened in the past in our childhood things that have been imprinted in our brain we just want to shoo that away but i think the path is in one way or the other confronting that and working through it, seeing that you're actually safe. And uh, that's a long story, man. That's some psychology. But I do think it all comes from our childhood, essentially, on why we run away from things, or why we run away in things, <laughs> in our in our dumb addictions. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Have you heard of uh, Gabor Monte? Mm-hmm, yeah. Are you uh, familiar with his theories on childhood trauma leading to addiction? I've listened to him a little bit. I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to speak it here though. I do. Would you be able to? Um, Yeah. I I did a video on one of his main ideas where basically when we're born, we have two needs, the need for attachment and the need to be authentic. Mm. And for little kids and babies, if you don't stay attached to adults, you will die. So the need for attachment is greater than the need to be authentic. So what happens when a a child grows up in a very chaotic situation, they're often, they often have to suppress their authenticity Mm. in order to stay attached to adults that are abusing them or neglecting them or just treating them horribly. That's where trauma is built. And the more you suppress your authenticity, the more you're going to have to chase that feeling later in life, usually Mm. through addiction. So what Gabor Mate says, when somebody hits the heroin or you know hits it's it's like a feeling of being hugged by god or by their parents again it's like that feeling of acceptance so the more you have to suppress your authenticity the more you're going to trace chase attachment through addictive means later Mm. that's powerful yeah man i think you know when you see people who have extreme addiction issues they often have a traumatic childhood I mean, everybody's got something in their childhood, Mm -hmm. but when you see somebody that has a very good, stable upbringing, they're usually a lot more balanced and, you know, they don't have that addictive personality, but, you know, we're living in a society and a culture where addiction is the best business model. So, you now have every corporation that understands this, you know, if I sell you something and it cures your thing, that's not a very good business model (laughs) because I only got paid once. Mm-hmm. So every business model is either a subscription or just something that um, plays on your impulses in yeah. a way that, you know, and we are, the, we have the same biology that we had 10,000 years ago when we were desperately searching for blueberries on the savannah. Mm-hmm. Now that same biology is the thing that's killing us because there's sugary foods everywhere. Mm-hmm. We're we're drowning in entertainment. We're suffocating with so much sugar and junk food. Yeah. You know, but before the person that could seek that out the best was the one that was going to survive. So that same primal behavior pattern is the thing that's getting us in trouble now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That same drive for survival is actually what is killing us. So now it's kind of the opposite. It's the people who can self-regulate are going to be the ones that are going to pass their genes on. Yeah, right. The people that can't have the people that just give into those impulses, 
are going to be the type of guy that gets an AI girlfriend and just gets lost <laughs> in the metaverse. Yeah. You know, if you can't, if you don't have the wow. willpower to step away from that AI girlfriend, you are not going to pass your genes on because mm. you're not going to meet a partner in the real world. That's a fascinating way to look at it. It's like a different stage in evolution. What we described before was Darwinian evolution, literal survival of your code just to plain out survive. Just transfer your code. Just, just survive, man. Just make sure you get enough food and procreate. Pretty simple. But now the stage of evolution, it seems like to transfer the code is more mature. It's more um, enlightened. It's more just like it's a higher stage. Like it seems like the next generations are going to be like a code that isn't dependent just upon survival like the epigenetics of what that code will entail will be something of pretty much higher beings more intelligent beings but intelligence that is more than just pertain to survival like actually uh just i don't know what's the word i'm looking for just like a different wavelength a higher awareness yeah, just like a, ultimately yeah. a higher awareness that will be encoded in our genes just naturally from that. Because if not, like you said, there's going to be people that aren't going to plainly procreate because they have AI girlfriends. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a different way of looking at it. I like that, though. I think ultimately that's what it comes down to is this like a, a next stage in evolution. We're evolving ourselves personally, but also altogether at a collective level. We're evolving to a higher species, a higher being, more wise altogether. Maybe that's the word I was looking for. We're just wiser. We're getting a lot wiser in um, figuring out who and what the hell we really are here, <laughs> you know, and uh, going from being at the whim of our environment, that's Darwinian evolution, to actually creating alongside our environment, molding. That creative aspect is like molding our world, molding our environment. And that does translate into the future generations, you know? Yeah, we're creating a new being, ultimately. It seems like we're just all together, we're creating a whole new wavelength of living. And this is the time where, like, this is the great transition, right? I think we spoke about this a little before, the times we're in are insane. Ultimately, I see it as, like, humanity's puberty period. And what is that? That's a great transition for an individual. I think that is what we're at right now is at a collective level, is we're metamorphosizing into something else like a butterfly like a caterpillar going into a butterfly right now it seems like we're just coming out of the cocoon and we're figuring out what it means to fly right do you feel that oh 100 percent, absolutely yeah. and yeah i think it, there are so many crises and issues to look at what's going on in the world but at the core at the very base it's a spiritual it's a spiritual thing it's a you could call it a spiritual war or a spiritual split. Uh, the Alchemist, we did a video earlier this year that got a lot of uh, people talking about, she talks about a timeline split mm -hmm. between the third dimension and the fifth dimension and that certain chosen ones are moving their consciousness into the fifth dimension and certain other ones, unfortunately, are going to get kind of left behind and they're going to get locked into the material world because they're you can see this material materialist thinking oh yeah that it gets so materialistic that you get to the point where you think psychological issues can be solved by regulating chemicals in the brain mm. i mean that's the type of thinking that you get to that's so it's like calcified yeah you know it's it's, it's locked mm -hmm. whereas the 5d consciousness is super expansive and it and it's just it transcends time and space mm -hmm. yeah whereas the third di third dimensional thinking it gets locked completely locked in the material until it's like a rock <laughs> there's a limit right yeah <laughs> yeah that's where darwinian evolution has gotten us it got us to this where we are now in the mind but evolution hasn't stopped man I think that's a huge fallacy that we live under. We think like we're here, we got it, we got Google, <laughs> we got Wikipedia, we got this technology, that's it. This is this is it, guys. But no, the story is still going on. Our story of who we're becoming, it's not finished. And I don't know if it ever will become finished or whatever that looks like, what is finished, I don't know. But point of the story is like, we're still evolving. 
But right now it's conscious evolution. Like we're taking it into our own hands. And that is wild. Like when we're not at the whim of our environment anymore, and now we can actually decide what we want to become. I can't even fathom what that means at a collective level, right? I feel it though. I feel it's real. Like I feel this resonance of like growth, right? Overall growth as an individual and growth as a species. Like the show goes on, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. It's like we're still, we're still going. But if you are locked in that popular paradigm, that calcified paradigm, as you said, you're not going to see it. It's just going to look like looniness, right? <laughs> to what we're talking about right now, to the popular paradigm, the the normies. You can say, I hate to be like that. I don't want to sound arrogant, but it's true, man. The, the 3D mindset, the 5D mindset doesn't make any sense. It's just like, what are these guys talking about? This is words out. But if you know, you know. If you feel it within, then it's obvious, right? It's like, oh, yeah, of course, we're, we're doing something here. There's something being built you could say there's something going on right the novelty is becoming exponential the transcendental object at the end of time as terence mckenna, as, would as say. Terrence mckenna yep. yeah <laughs> um uh, it's funny that you mentioned that i literally just animated that that sentence that he said really <laughs> about the transcendental object at the end of time is that the next video uh that is a video that i will probably sit on for a little while before releasing it mm. um my next video is about how we are not living in a simulation. Ooh, okay. It's a good, good case for, ironically, I've made a video that we are living in a simulation in a different video, but um, this argument was pretty interesting. So is the counterpoint. Uh, the counterpoint is actually not that as sexy as the idea that we are in the matrix. It's just kind of like a matter of understanding mathematics and probability and that there is a better than 50% chance that we are not in the simulation mm. just because we don't even know if the simulation is possible. So we're assuming that it's possible. Yeah. So based on that assumption, where, where I, I see that where that assumption comes from, just because video games are getting so much better, our technology is just keeps getting better. We keep integrating with technology more and more. So it's like at some point, how integrated are we? We're going to get so integrated that we're not going to know we're integrated. We're, that's just going to be the reality. Um, but that is just one possibility of two possibilities. The other possibility is that there is no simulation and that this is base reality. And it's it's a long, it's very complicated, hard to explain. I'm still like going through it. So that's the next video. The video after that is about um, the prodigal son uh, Bible story, which yeah. I'm really excited about this video. It's um, I love to take ancient stories and then interpret them, the sim symbolism. Yeah. So the prodigal son is an awesome story about, it's really hard to interpret. Uh, it's about a father who asked his two sons um, who wants to spend their inheritance. And the youngest son's like, oh, me, I want to go out and spend it. And so the dad, it's really insulting to, to basically say to your parents, give me my inheritance and I want to leave. I mean, that's basically like, I'd rather have money than be with you. Mm -hmm. And so the, the youngest son takes the money, goes off, lives impulsively, gets with a bunch of prostitutes, drinks, gambles, ends up losing everything and has to feed pigs. And he's not even allowed to eat the food that he feeds the pigs. And at that point, he humbles himself and says, I'm worthless. I need to go back to my dad and I'll be his servant. I'll be a slave. I'll, I'll do anything to just be back with my dad. So he the dad gets word that he's coming back and he gets ready for a celebration. He's like, my son's returning home. And so when the son returns home, he's, he's all ashamed. And the older son is like, what the hell dad? I've never left. I've stayed with you the whole time. And now you're going to have this big celebration for the guy that left you. And he's been off with prostitutes and doing all these things and living immorally. I've been right by your side and you're going to give welcome this guy back to your kingdom and you're going to slaughter the biggest calves we have, the fatty calves. What, what gives? And the dad says, you're, you're a good boy. You'll always be with me. And then he runs down to the prodigal son and hugs him and says, you were lost and now you're found. So I never understood that story. I'm like, what does that mean? But there's a very deep meaning behind it that you are the father in the story. And the older son is your intellect. 
And the younger son is your sense for understanding the world and going out. And you have to lose yourself in order to return to yourself. Yeah. You kind of have to do that. Yeah. You can't just stay home all the time. And it's when you understand that that's the meaning of the story, you can see that every story that we resonate with tells the same story. You think about Lion King, you know, you have, have you seen Lion King? Oh yeah. Way back. Yeah. I haven't, I'm not, uh, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with it, to be honest with you. I point. love to trace like the origins of, of ancient stories to our modern day stories. Mm. So like you have Mufasa, who's like the good father. And then you have Zazu, who's the little bird that represents the intellect. Zazu never leaves Mufasa's side and he's very logical and scared of the real world. And Simba wants to go see what it's all about. And so you've got to go out and lose things and discover who you are before you can return to yourself. And then Lion King has that beautiful scene where he's kind of lost everything. And then Mufasa appears to him in the sky and says, Simba, you've forgotten who you are. And he's like, no, don't leave me, you know, but that epic scene. And so he has to, he realizes that he has to fulfill his destiny. So kind of like before we can appreciate what our destiny is, we've got to go out and make mistakes and lose things and have experiences and I think it's a really important part of life that that story had a profound impact on me because it's like you've you've got to experience the world before you can change try to change the world or try to you know you got to figure out who you are by taking risks and yeah making mistakes falling down and getting back up mm. very well said yeah thanks that's the metaphor i feel the prodigal son it is the giant metaphor for the spiritual path and what this learning process is all about. How do you know what you are if you don't know what you are? You have to figure out what you're not in order to figure out what you are. You have to lose yourself in order to find yourself. It's just the part of the human journey, I feel, is how else do you, how else, right? With this free will that we were endowed with, we have, we have an alignment that we can use the free will with but how do you know what is aligned and what isn't aligned if you don't if you don't try essentially <laughs> like if you don't try things that um yeah like take risks i guess is what you said if you don't take risks how do you know what is good for you and what isn't good for you i like to say you have to know what isn't it in order to know what is it and that's the prodigal son, man. Yeah, that's such a powerful story. And um, I didn't get it either until very recently. But if you do look at not only that story, but many other stories in scripture, from that standpoint of self-realization, you know how to analyze it at more than a surface level. It means so much for you. Really, the whole Bible, if you look at it like that, as more of like a psychology book, you know, like very meaningful stories that have these uh just parables that are pertained specifically for you i think if you can look at scripture as like what is this message for me how does this relate to my journey and like the what is the esoteric meaning here deep down inside that is like if you can look at it for these words were written for my eyes if you can look at it like that the bible means a lot more than just some kind of story of people that got um I don't want to get too much into it, but it's more than just the surface level of the Bible. And if you can translate any scripture, it doesn't even have to be the Bible. Like I feel as though, you know, you can look at the Vedas, you can look at the Quran, anything really, the or the Lion King. If you can look at that as like, okay, how is this for me? And it means a lot more than just looking at it as like some kind of story about that's that's out there. I'm over here. That's anything, right? Any totally. teaching, any teaching is, a, if it's a valid teaching, would you say it's about you? It's about the person? And if not, then is it really valid? <laughs> yeah, well, Rumi said, I searched for God and only found myself. I searched for myself and only found God. There it is. So it's kind of, like, kind of like as above, so below, like as you discover yourself within, you will 
the outer world were will adapt around you you know you yeah. change the way you see and everything changes right you know what you see changes yeah man um yeah like I, i've discovered that at one point i was bitter and nihilistic and i wanted the world to change and i thought that if the world changed things would get better for me personally and i found out that the most fundamental lesson is basically the only thing you can control is yourself so you have to change mm -hmm. and i've discovered through small incremental improvements to myself the world around me opened up and so like the more kind and responsible i became the more opportunity opened up to me and it's it, it seems counterintuitive right like you know i want more money well then go meditate or go work out or go work on yourself how's that going to get me more money that doesn't pay anything you know like yeah you you gotta you gotta go inward to you know it, you can see this in every aspect of, of everything like if you study our history if you study our history you will have a better sense of where we're going now yeah you know if you there's a direct connection between understanding our own psychology and wanting to go to outer space you know it's like mm. going deeper in the inner world makes us want to go expand farther in the outer world yeah and so like look at during the 1960s we had all this psychedelic renaissance and people were exploring with ideas and we went to space and for then we had the war on drugs for 50 years and that style of thinking that consciousness got dimmed and we stopped trying to go to space we stopped caring about it and now there's a, another psychedelic renaissance people are experimenting with these new philosophies and we're suddenly very interested in going to space again so it seems connected to me definitely yeah as above so below totally save yourself to save the world yeah totally. man. if you can look at it like that it makes a lot more sense like we're in the one mind we are in the mind of god some great philosopher said i feel that look at oneself almost as like a node in the mind of god and the universe is is the brain and we're just we're here might be a crude example but i feel that this interconnectivity between all things and you said it the greatest impact we can have is really in the small moments of how we decide to live our life it's um yeah like being kind just being loving essentially being a little bit more selfless in one's life and definitely meditating for sure slowing down disconnecting from the noise and just going inward and that means so much right it means so much i feel it i feel the difference in doing that regularly and uh tapping in regularly this changes up my world so much man i feel it and uh yeah that's the beauty of it is we can all save the world per se in all our own ways and it doesn't take much you don't have to do anything crazy it really just comes down to being a good person <laughs> but being good for yourself like being treating yourself kind right taking care of yourself whether it's health your mind your body all of it your spirit yeah, like take care of yourself first and then just naturally effortlessly your world around you will change and uh yeah man that's the that's the essence we've all heard that right go within <laughs> the truth is within we we know that we've all heard that i'm pretty sure but it really is it's a cliche but it really is the truth you got to go within treat yourself right and then without we'll just follow right and then uh, also too like i said treat others a little bit better and that will also lead to like a chain reaction of goodness like if you hold the door for somebody or maybe you tip the homeless guy like those little things mean so much and they have a butterfly effect of changing the world your life as well but changing the world in those little moments so yeah you don't have to become an artist or start a podcast or do anything crazy it really is so simple as just like slow down and love <laughs> slow down and love man <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah you said it you definitely said it right there and it, it's definitely about those small moments yeah you know like school does not prepare us 
for no. adult life of just day in and day out of going to like grocery stores and dealing with like corporate the corporate world or like these mundane routine experiences that you're going to have to deal with every single day and if you approach those experiences like oh my god this sucks for me and like oh why is this happening to me if your default mode mm. is that it's all happening to you you're going to be miserable yeah but if you can just a slight change of your mindset and see things from another person's perspective like maybe that person that cut you off in traffic maybe they're trying to get to the hospital because their son's sick yeah or something maybe the you know i i always try to do this weird thing where like whenever i have this like very corporate dry experience with somebody this interaction i try to bring a light into it like mm. whenever i talk to somebody on the phone that's like customer service yeah i just try to like infuse a little bit of humanity into that and i try to get a, us to laugh together or something i love when like you can get that that light into like the most material dry situation right it's kind of like the show the office i find yeah. the office to be a beautiful show as well as funny because these people are in this like horrific lame experience right but they have these beautiful connections and they're really living life to the fullest in this horrible situation mm -hmm. and i've always been drawn towards stories that have this like very stark contrast where mm -hmm. somebody is in like prison yet they find god or they find this beautiful uplifting enlightenment within a dark situation and then i think our culture is drawn to the opposite too we like to watch rich people like the kardashians have a miserable time mm. you know we, we are drawn to contrast yeah every time we yeah as humans like if something doesn't have contrast it doesn't it's not a shiny object it doesn't capture our attention so in my content creation i also experiment a lot with contrast you know why do why do uh smart people believe stupid things mm. why are stupid people so confident mm. you know th that's a con contrast type of idea but anytime you present an idea like that it gets a lot of attention yeah well said and sadly i think a lot of content creators are aware of this and they just they're cynical just for the sake of being cynical because they know that it gets attention mm. so if i if i saw something that's really good and i make a video about how it actually sucks even if i'm completely wrong it's going to get attention yep oh yeah you i know, know what you mean if i if i said hey actually ai is is peaked it's it's going down now people are like what i thought ai was like on the way up yeah <laughs> you know all you have to do is be a contrarian and you get attention so like <laughs> unfortunately youtube is just flooded with people being contrarian for the sake of being contrarian and it yeah. also doesn't take very much intelligence to be a critic it takes a lot of intelligence to present an, a case and make an argument for it it's very mm. easy to tear something down so mm. people kind of feel smart when they do that too i've noticed a lot of a rise in cynicism in oh. the comments and oh yeah it's just out of control but you know that really doesn't get you anywhere like yeah you feel good for maybe a minute yeah. tearing somebody down but like you know, it just stems from your own lack of belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, man. Contrast. We love contrast. Yeah. Yeah. I had a point. I don't remember what I was going to say now. Yeah, I, I kind of just rambled on right there. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I like it. What was the original point? Like, what, what, um, Small incremental. And, oh, seeing reality not from your default mode and having oh, these like, yeah. yeah. The point of like... um say you're talking to a customer service rep and you throw a joke in there and then you related that to the office it's sort of like what they do in the office where they break the fourth wall as well they like they look right at the camera that's sort of alluding to what you said like you try to throw a joke in a corporate environment you're breaking the fourth wall like you're breaking out of the script of the matrix and you're you're kind of writing another script like you're i don't know you're shedding light upon just the mundane and there's something special about that too i try to do that as well like try to like see the light in the darkness right if you do that and little things like that and i love when people do that for me like we're in this like you know line at the grocery store it sucks and we're just waiting we want to get through it and then someone will throw a joke in there and it just makes me go ah oh, of course i forgot <laughs> i forgot again oh of course because i think we all know we know how do i put this i was gonna say we know the truth that might just seem like a platitude but 
in a way we like we all we all have this like funny feeling of what's going on whether somebody is lost in the darkness or not so i think humor does that like there's something very special about humor and throwing a joke where a joke probably shouldn't be that allows one to get that quick glimpse into like oh i forgot who i was for a second you know that like oh of course something very powerful about humor i feel the greatest teachers i feel are the humorous ones that can break the fourth wall even on their own teachings right the ones that can even like make fun of themselves there's something special about that and i think it really just comes down to contrast like you said as well it's like it, you throw your own black to the white right you throw your own like twist in the story into the plot and uh that's that's powerful man that's pretty much zen that's like a zen kohan right if you can insert your own zen kohans into the world i think that <laughs> that means a lot <laughs> well hu- humor is contrast I yeah mean, the, it, it's surprise like the more of a contrast you can create with your your joke the bigger the laugh's going to be yeah exactly you know, the, yeah. the bigger the gap between the expectation and then what the joke actually is yep it's going to create the biggest laugh mm. that's good man yeah yeah contrast contrast it's all about contrast you know you probably work with colors right in terms of contrast oh yeah 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 i'm i'm i don't want to i could take an entire podcast about the way i think about color (laughs) yeah but it's all about contrast yes in all different aspects of the wavelengths of our energy whether it is through sound or visual just if you think about it in contrast but not for the sake of contrast because then you can get too cynical like you said but it is important to have an essence of contrast. Not too much, though. You got to s- keep the balance between the yin and the yang. <laughs> yeah, it's not like too much a, yin. A relationship, not too much exactly. You know, if you if you have two people that are identical, there's there's no there's nothing happening. There's no. Yeah. You got to find the right combination of contrast that that fits together, like the yin and yang. That's it, man. Yep. As above, the, so uh, below. Divine masculine, divine feminine. That's, me. That's the dance, man. Yeah. I have this visualization of just this just this perfect balance of the yin and yang right now. I just I just see it. I feel it in all aspects. I think that's why the yin yang symbol is so it's so poignant for us. Like it just means so much. Because it's like that is the in terms of the symbol that it paints in our mind, it's like that is the essence of it that's it (laughs) you know that's like that's the Tao. that is literally that's that's it right there man right you could have the yin and yang in many different attributes but just that simple circle it's so like ah it's very powerful yeah and on on a grand level you have that contrast happening where we were just talking about most of the conversation where you have this um great awakening at the same time you have this like great reset You've got mm-hmm. this like people are bursting out into the 5D, whereas like there's like these forces that are suffocating people down into the 3D. And so it's it's almost like that extreme contrast of like the darkness brings out the extreme lightness. Exactly. And vice versa. So you kind of be thankful for like the darkness that, you know, Frodo should be very thankful for Sauron because mm-hmm. otherwise he would have done nothing and just sat in the Shire. <laughs> and there would have been no story because that's what it's all right. about. The contrast totally. brings story. It brings adventure. Yeah. I mean, most times the hero in the story is pretty lame. They're, they don't, they don't have much of a character. They're kind of defined by the anti-hero. Yeah. You know, exactly. the, the greater the anti-hero, the anti-hero has all the fun. Mm. You know, I think I've heard from screenwriters that, Writing the anti-hero is way more fun than writing the hero. Because mm. the villain can do anything. They can, there's no rules. They can, that's fun. You know, for me as an artist, drawing hell is very fun. Ooh. Drawing heaven has always been kind of like, <laughs> you got to be very careful with the gradients and the shading has to be right. And it's kind of like you're drawing nothing. Whereas hell, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. There's like torture and orgies and crazy crazy <laughs> stuff's happening down there yeah and it's very fun to draw it's chaos but the chaos needs order even though the order might be a little boring chaos and order they bring this beautiful dance yeah i mean we can go on and on about this the yeah, beauty totally. of contrast <laughs> i, love I it. get it though i feel it yeah and it all alludes to adventure i think it's the hero's journey 
if one can find this, the yin and the yang essence, the masculine and the feminine, many different labels as we spoke on. But if one can find that and weigh that within the being, you can find that sense of adventure and purpose and fulfillment. And uh, that's the journey, man. That's the hero's journey. That's the spiritual journey. And that's the way. I feel it. I feel it's real. It's powerful stuff. But um, yeah, we've been talking for a while here. We can go on and on. Uh, I think we should start to wrap it up. But yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say? No, this has been a really fun conversation. Uh, you got a great energy. I almost feel like the things you say could be like poems. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. You're not the first person to say that, but uh, hey, man, I'm just on here just having a good time. So I, I appreciate that. I really, that means a lot to me. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, you have good energy as well, man. I appreciate you, your overall spirit that you brought to this conversation. I think it was great. And uh, that's it. I wish you all the best. Seriously. You too. Yeah. Thanks yeah. a lot. And um, yeah, I appreciate you. And I'm excited for you to put this one out. And uh, I hope your podcast just continues to soar. Thanks, man. We'll see. We shall see. <laughs> but yeah, appreciate you. I wish you all the best. Peace and love to you and peace and love to anybody that listened this long. See you later, y'all.